I'm Margaret Brennan in Washington, and this week on Face the Nation, presidential politics takes center stage within all three branches of government, and those politics get personal on the Republican campaign trail. As former President Trump juggled court rulings, caucuses, and Supreme Court arguments, it was the current president and the special counsel Robert Hur's investigation into Mr. Biden's mishandling of classified documents that led to the week's most damaging headlines. Although the Hur report cleared the president of criminal wrongdoing, he described Biden as a well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory a damning characterization for the 81-year-old president. The president responded with fury. I'm well-meaning and I'm an elderly man and I know what the hell I'm doing. My memory is not good. My memory is fine. Vice President Harris went even further, calling hers words clearly politically motivated, gratuitous. Will Democrats take on their own Justice Department? We'll talk to President Biden's personal attorney, Bob Bauer. GOP presidential contender Nikki Haley will join us to make her case for mental competency tests for both Biden and Trump. And as Israel prepares to invade southern Gaza, there is increasing concern among its allies. We'll check in with Connecticut Senator Chris Murphy, one of the key negotiators of that short-lived bipartisan border bill. He's trying to get aid to Israel and Ukraine through Congress. Finally, as America prepares to tune in to Super Bowl 58, our very own James Brown will be here to tell us how things have gotten better on and off the field for the NFL. It's all just ahead on Face the Nation. Good morning and welcome to Face the Nation. Washington is still reeling from the White House pushback on special counsel Robert Hur's report, and we will get to that momentarily. But we want to begin today with the last candidate standing between Donald Trump and the Republican nomination. That is former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley. She's on the campaign trail in North Augusta, South Carolina, and joins us this morning. Good morning to you. Thanks, Margaret, for having me. So, Ambassador, you have made mental acuity a signature issue for your campaign for the better part of the past year. You're handing out paper copies now of a cognitive assessment. When do you plan to take it, and are you at all concerned that you might turn off some older voters? I have no problem taking it. And what I've said is we need to have mental competency tests for anyone over the age of 75. I don't care if we do it for 50 and up. But what happened with Joe Biden this week and what we've seen with Donald Trump is another example of why. We have to face the reality of the fact that when you get to those ages, you get diminished. These are people making decisions on our national security. These are people making decisions on the future of our economy. We need to know they're at the top of their game. This morning, NATO, the Western Alliance, issued a statement responding to remarks Donald Trump made last night at a rally, and they warned it puts U.S. soldiers at risk. Here's what he said. One of the presidents of a big country stood up and said, well, sir, uh, if we don't pay and we're attacked by Russia, will you protect us? I said, you didn't pay? No, I would not protect you. In fact, I would encourage them to do whatever the hell they want. If elected, would you adhere to the premise that an attack on one is an attack on all? I mean, absolutely. NATO has been a success story for the last 75 years. But what bothers me about this is don't take the side of a thug who kills his opponents. Don't take the side of someone who has gone in and invaded a country and half a million people have died or been wounded because of Putin. Don't take the side of someone who continues to lie. I dealt with Russia every day. The last thing we ever want to do is side with Russia. What we always need to remember is America needs to have friends. After September 10th, we needed a lot of friends. We can never get into the point where we don't need friends. Now, we do want NATO allies to pull their weight, but there are ways you can do that without sitting there and telling Russia, have your way with these countries. That's not what we want. If you notice, Russia has never invaded a NATO country. They've invaded Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine. They are actually very intimidated by by NATO. NATO allows us to prevent war. We need to always focus on preventing war. I, I want to ask you about another comment that Donald Trump made that was personal 
about your husband, Major Michael Haley, who is currently deployed with the South Carolina National Guard. Trump said this about you. Where's her husband? Oh, he's away. He's away. Where, what happened to her husband? What happened to her husband? Where is he? He's gone. I know you said this is disqualifying, but during his first presidential uh, campaign, Donald Trump mocked former POW John McCain and a Gold Star family. He was still elected. You agreed to work for him. Why do you think that's disqualifying now? Well, I agreed to serve our country, and I'm proud that I got to serve our country. Um, there's, there's nothing, um, no more higher honor than to serve um, the people of this country. But what I can tell you is, look, it's just, it's insulting to military members. It's insulting to military families. And the part that bothers me is he continues to do this. This isn't personal about me and Michael. This is about what it says to every member who sacrifices for us. This is about what it says to every military family who sacrifices alongside of them. We can't have someone who sits there and mocks our men and women who are trying to protect America. It's a pattern. It's a pattern of chaos. It's a pattern of irresponsibility. It's a pattern of just saying things that are that are not helpful in strengthening America. And this is a chance America's going to get to decide. We know what Donald Trump is. You could watch that whole rally yesterday and it'll tell you all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, do you want it again? We know what Joe Biden is. You can see the press conference. You can look at the special investigation that says he's diminished. But do you want it again? I mean, the one thing we need to understand is for Republicans with Donald Trump, he lost in 2018, he lost in 2020, he lost in 2022. And if you look at after the New Hampshire election, he went on this unhinged rant and all he did was talk about revenge. Mm -hmm. And then you look, he said, anyone that supported me was barred permanently from MAGA. Then he pushed the RNC to name him the presumptive nominee. Then he lost his court case and he went on a rant again. The problem with all of that is at no point is he ever talking about the American people. He's never talking about the fact that we have wasteful spending and we're $34 trillion in debt. He's not talking about the fact that only 31% of eighth graders in our country are proficient in reading. He's not talking about an open board where all it takes is one to have a 9-11 moment. Well, he's not talking about the lawlessness in our cities, and he's not talking about anything about the wars that are happening around the world. That's the problem. That's what we're facing when this decision comes down in the election. Well, he did talk about the border. In fact, he encouraged Republicans to kill the bipartisan deal that was brokered. Um, and last night, he was also talking about, at this very critical moment for Ukraine, uh, when the Senate is this weekend debating military aid, he came out and criticized the nearly $100 billion aid package. Given what you know, would you encourage Republican lawmakers now to back this nearly $100 billion security supplemental? Well, the first thing I'll say is, you know, I think that Biden and Congress have done a poor job telling Americans why they should care about Ukraine. And so you can't blame the American people if they say, why are we doing this? The way we need to look at it is I don't think we should give any country straight up cash because you can't follow That's it. That's not can't what this hold is. It accountable. But I do think we should support Ukraine and I do think we should give them the equipment and ammunition to win. Because listen to Putin's own words. He said once he takes Ukraine, Poland and the Baltics are next. Those are NATO countries and that puts America at war. This is about preventing war. That's the important reason why we have to support Ukraine. I want to ask you about Israel. Um, half of U.S. adults polled believe that the military response from Israel in the Gaza Strip has gone too far. That's according to the latest AP poll. That's up from 40 percent in the month of November. Do you think half of Americans are wrong on this issue? I don't think I will never say that any American person is wrong. It's not for a leader to say whether they're wrong or right or good or bad. That's the problem that we have in America now. I think what's important is just to explain and communicate why this matters. I have been in Israel multiple times. I've been on the border um, and seen all the threats that face Israel. But when you look at what happened on October 7th, when they beheaded those people and burned those babies alive and took those girls out of the concert and raped them and dragged their naked bodies through the streets of Gaza, what did they say? Death to 
to Israel, death to America. That's what Hamas so, said. Yes. After 9-11, did we want anyone to tell us what to do? No. We wanted to make sure that we destroyed the terrorists. Israel sure, wants to destroy the terrorists. We all care about the people in Gaza. We all do. The problem is Hamas is holding them hostage. They always have. But right. Margaret, where are the Arab countries? Where are the Arab countries saying, going to Hamas saying, we need to protect the people of Gaza. They're because trying to Israel help negotiate doesn't want to do this a, a to the people of Gaza. Release, many of them right now. But, but are you saying you disagree well, with President Biden when he says Israelis have gone over the top in referring to the civilian casualties? Hamas has said they're going to do this again. Israel needs to do whatever it takes to make sure this doesn't happen again. And that means eliminating Hamas. They have tried working with all of the Arab countries to go and help the people of Gaza. If, the, if anybody worries about the people of Gaza, ask the Arab community, why aren't you stopping Hamas? Why aren't you stopping Iran? They have the ability to do that. Why are you going to Israel? I have seen you, many you know times where everybody runs to Israel's to defense when she gets... Yeah, but the point is, don't go and blame Israel for this. I have seen many times where Israel gets hit and everybody supports Israel. But when Israel hits back, everybody condemns her. That is wrong. They went through a horrific time. You've got to go to Hamas. Why are we not putting the pressure on Iran and Hamas? That's where the pressure should be. Why would you put it on the one that was hit? That's not what we do. We should have the backs of Israel and force the Arab countries to tell Hamas they've got to stop. That would end this war immediately. Ambassador Haley, thank you for your time this morning. Face the Nation will be back in one minute, so stay with us. And we're joined now by President Biden's personal attorney, Bob Bauer, a former White House counsel during the Obama administration. He's also married to Biden White House senior advisor, Anita Dunn. Welcome and good to talk to you in person. Thank you. Glad to be here. So the special counsel determined no prosecution should happen in regard to the mishandling of classified information. Um, this was a decision in your favor, but you asked the special counsel to reevaluate what you called, quote, highly prejudicial language. Did anyone appeal directly to Attorney General Garland or the Justice Department on that point? Well, we made submissions in paper on those points, but let me just take a step back. To the special counsel. To the special counsel, and we reiterated them again on paper to the attorney general, because this is a report that went off the rails. It's a shabby work product. Let's, let's take a step back. It starts with a legal conclusion that was foregone from the very beginning. The investigation could have been concluded in two or three months. It went on for over 15 months. And so along with the legal conclusion comes this flood of characterizations, factual misstatements, pejorative comments about the president that are inconsistent with DOJ policy and norms, and that, as you see, over the last 48 hours have been widely criticized by legal experts. This is not what prosecutors do. It is shoddy work product. But it was the attorney general's commitment to make this public that put this in this space. Did you ever ask the Justice Department not to make it public? No. Or consider doing so? No. 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 And what did the Attorney General say when you raised these issues to him? It's evident that he had committed to make the report public the way that the special counsel had written it. Mm -hmm. And so that's the report that we have. Because he did not release any additional letter or anything. Did the Attorney General essentially endorse this work product? I cannot say, I won't speak for the Attorney General's views. I can simply say that the arguments that we made about the inconsistency of this report with basic norms, setting aside the foregone clear legal conclusion in the president's favor, the failures of this report uh, that we brought up did not ultimately change the outcome. So in terms of Justice Department policy, things are different in terms of regulation for a special counsel. Um, and I want to ask you specifically about what I think you're referring to as pejorative comments. You're specifically talking about um, what the language here from Heard that the president didn't remember when he was vice president. He forgot the first day of the interview when his term ended. When did I stop being vice president? He forgot the second day of the interview when his term began and within several years could not recall when his son Bo died. Is that specifically the part that you think is pejorative? That's among the problems uh, with the work product. Again, I'm taking it outside the legal analysis, which was foregone and correct. Mm -hmm. I'm taking it to misstatements of fact and commentary that's totally inappropriate, including the comments that you're 
referring to. So, okay, so when you say misstatements of fact, you were in the room. I was. For this deposition yes, over two days, five hours. Correct. Did the president have problems recalling details? I recall from that interview a president who engaged with the questions very directly and gave his best recollection, and in fact, I think was quite helpful to the special counsel, who elsewhere in the report actually cites as compelling and forceful one piece of that testimony. Let me tell you a striking sort of vignette, as I recall it, from the interview. The special counsel opens by thanking the president for making the scheduled appointment. Mm -hmm. It could have been rescheduled given international events, and he makes a point of saying, we're grateful that knowing what else is going on in the world, that you kept the appointment. Should it have and, been rescheduled? And then he proceeds, I'll, I'll address that question as well, then he proceeds to say, I'm going to be taking you through events that are many years ago. Mm -hmm. He flags that. So all I can ask is your best recollection, and that is precisely what the president did. He engaged, he answered the questions, and the special counsel's decision to cherry pick in a very misleading way some of the references that you're discussing here is an example of what I call a really shabby work product and completely out of bounds for a prosecutor. I should mention also, Margaret, the special counsel rules uh, do not exempt the special counsel from DOJ norms and policies. In fact, they specifically hold the special counsel to DOJ norms and policies. So what you're talking about and letters you've released make it sound like there are indeed transcripts that you have of these conversations over the 8th and the 9th. Yes, I'm drawing here on my recollections, but yes, there are transcripts. And as you heard um, Ian Sams in the press briefing room say, you know, there are discussions underway because it's a classified document about mm -hmm what could or whether will be or when released, I can't add anything to that today. Do you favor releasing them? Well, it's really a decision that has to take place within the government. It's a classified the document. Counsel, I'm the president's personal counsel. Right. Would you recommend yes. that these be made public if they indeed back up your personal record? Again, there's a process underway. I'm not a specialist in that process, and so I really have to defer to those who have to work through those issues. Okay. But because just this past week alone, the president, in public remarks, mixed up the leaders of France Germany, and he referred to Egypt as Mexico. Does the president have any memory problems? He does not. I was in the interview room. And, and let me tell you one other vignette from the interview room. There were a couple of occasions when the special counsel, who had flagged at the beginning that sometimes he asks imprecise questions, asked questions that the president picked apart as a matter of logic. Mm -hmm. He showed that the questions didn't have a logical underpinning. Now, Everybody in the room recognized that was the case. It showed the president was listening carefully and understood precisely what was wrong with those questions. Mm -hmm. I didn't come away from the special counsel's failure to ask precise questions and think to myself, he has mental acuity problems. I just thought he was asking bad questions. So the vice president accused the special counsel of being clearly politically motivated. What evidence do you have to back up that assertion? What I was concerned about in the course of this investigation is that we had a special counsel who had one eye on the foregone legal conclusions and one eye on the inevitable storm from members of his own party when he had to conclude that the president had not broken the law. So you have to wonder, with those pressures impinging on the investigation from the outside, knowing the attacks the Republicans had levied on the law enforcement process, did he decide, we would have to ask, that he would reach the only legal conclusion possible and then toss in the rest of it to placate a certain political the special, constituency? The special counsel has been praised in the past by Democratic senators from his home state of Maryland. Um, and I know when the president took office, he said he wants to restore the honor, integrity, and independence of the DOJ. Doesn't leveling these charges of being politically motivated do the same thing Donald Trump does when he says that the system's rigged? That's not what we're saying. Nobody's arguing on our side. I'm not arguing that the system is rigged. We're so looking at this motivated. particular performance by this particular special counsel in this particular case. And as legal experts around the country are saying, it just goes off the rails. It's a shabby piece of work. He arrived at the right legal conclusion and then 400 page later, misstatements of facts and totally inappropriate and pejorative comments that are unfounded and not supported by the record. The president blamed his aides even though he also said, I guess I wanted to hang on to some of these documents for posterity's sake. Were any of his aides punished for what the president said is their fault? Security I heard the president reasons? say that mistakes were made in the packing and shipping of materials during the transition, right. and he wished, he had looking back on staff. it, he had spent more time looking right. into it. He was, of course, busy. He was continuing to be the vice president of the United States. 
I don't know that blaming his aides, other than assigning the responsibility where it lay with the staff, is what the president had in mind. He was saying staff was clearly involved, responsible for the packing. We don't see presidents and vice presidents during transitions packing boxes. Uh, but he recognizes now when he looks back on it, maybe more involvement on his part was necessary because it didn't go the way he thought it should have gone. But specific to the documents related to Afghanistan, he did say he might have hung on to it for posterity's sake. Not that an aide hung Margaret, on to it. Margaret, you're referring, to be clear, and this is again a result of a report that was written in a particularly shabby and shoddy way. He's referring to a personal handwritten memorandum to the President of the United States, President Obama. Mm -hmm. His own personal handwritten memorandum that even the special counsel acknowledges was one that he would not have thought would include classified information. He thought it was a sensitive private document, mm -hmm. as were all his conversations with President Obama. But that's what it was, his own personal written memo to the president on a policy issue. And I might add, his position on that was well known, yes. well known. Yes, um, I'm told we have to leave it here, but uh, Bob Bauer, thank you for coming in. It's a in pleasure. Thank you very much. And making the case, as you did. Thank you. Uh, we'll be right back with a lot more Face the Nation, so stay with us. We turn now to Connecticut Democratic Senator Chris Murphy. He was a top negotiator on the immigration deal that collapsed last week. The Senate is now focused on trying to pass aid to Israel and Ukraine. Uh, Senator, good to have you here. Yeah. Um, I want to get to the border Later, I want to talk about the pieces you're trying to pick up here with this, uh, what, $95 billion emergency spending bill. Do you have any sense yet if there are 60 votes to pass all of this aid? I think we're going to pass this spending bill for Ukraine. We have already moved past several procedural hurdles that require 60 votes. I think there will be 60 votes in the end, and there has to be. On many days, Ukraine is firing one quarter of the artillery shells that Russia is. Some days they are only interrupting half the missiles that are being sent at Ukrainian cities. We are on the precipice of a disaster for Ukraine and for the world. Nikki Haley is right. Putin has made it clear mm -hmm. that if he wins Ukraine, he is going to continue on ultimately to a country that's going to get the United States directly involved in a confrontation with Russia. So it has been hard to get Republican votes to support Ukraine, made very difficult by Donald Trump's uh, opposition to Ukraine funding. Mm -hmm. But I think we're going to get this done in the Senate by early to mid next week. So on the border, the president has said the border's not secure. You were working to try to pass this legislation. In the absence of that, should he take executive action, and if so, what? Well, I think there's limited executive actions the president can take. He does not have the legal authority to shut down the border. Our bill, our bipartisan bill, would have given him that authority. If crossings were too high on a daily basis, the president could shut down portions of the border. The asylum system is broken. He can't fix that by executive order. It takes 10 years for people mm -hmm. to get an asylum claim processed. Many of them don't have legitimate claims. Only legislation can fix that. Our bill would have done that yeah. as soon as Republicans realized that it was actually going to fix the border. They voted against it en masse because they want the border to remain chaotic because it helps President Trump in his reelection efforts. We have more in depth to talk about on this issue. I have to take a break. Please stay here with us, Senator. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Face the Nation. We continue our conversation now with Connecticut Democratic Senator Chris Murphy. Um, you are optimistic that this massive security supplemental will pass this week, but there is pressure uh, within your party to add some strings on when it comes to Israel aid. Um, why is it that the White House appears to be so powerless to rein in Benjamin Netanyahu when they are clearly uncomfortable with how he's waging this war? Well, I think we saw an important development last week. The White House released a letter in which they made clear that if we approve new aid to Israel, they are going to make sure that it is used in compliance with U.S. and international human rights law. And I think that's incredibly important. Right now, the level of civilian casualty inside Gaza is unacceptable. And it does not accrue to the national security goals of the United States, nor Israel, because it is going to essentially keep Hamas in business inside Gaza and around the 
region as they use this grievance structure as a means to continue to recruit. So I do think that that clarification will be important. I think the president's willingness to speak up a little bit more strongly about the way in which this campaign is being conducted will likely have a change in the operational pace. And I think it's incredibly important for the United States and for Israel for Hamas to be defeated, but for there to be a dramatic reduction in the number of civilians that are being killed. To your point, um, the White House sent a group of officials out to Michigan to meet with Arab Americans there who are very upset with um, with how the president has communicated specifically. CBS has a recording of one of the conversations the deputy national security advisor had. He said, I do not have any confidence in the current government of Israel. He also said the administration has left a, quote, very damaging impression as to how much the president values the lives of Palestinians. Should there be more strings attached to this aid package you're about to vote on? So the president does believe deeply in the importance of preserving life inside Gaza and has continually pressed for more humanitarian aid to get into Gaza. There would not nearly be the number of shipments coming in today if this president wasn't pushing hard for change. Um, but yes, there are many of us who believe that it is very important for us to make clear with this aid package that if Israel is going to use these dollars to perpetuate this campaign inside Gaza, it has to be done in a way with less civilian life uh, being lost. I think that's that's important to members of Congress. I know that's important to this administration. And they're going to speak more about that. Now. I, I think you will clearly hear the president. My guess is that mm -hmm. based upon what the president said last week, that you're going to hear the president continue to stand up for a campaign that defeats Hamas, yes. but is done in a way that is much more respectful of civilian life. I'm going to ask you about the president. Um, as you know, he has mixed up the names of the French and German leaders. He referred to Egypt as Mexico. Adam Smith, who is the ranking Democrat in the House Armed Services Committee, said on Friday, um, Biden does not have the normal strength to go out there and campaign. I think we have the soundbite. He does not have the normal strength to go out there and campaign, you know, to do rally after rally and conversation after conversation. I'd rather have someone who's good at the job and not great at the campaigning than the other way around. But it's going to be a challenge yeah. to go out there and win that campaign. Do you agree with him? I don't. I mean, Joe Biden's the only person who's beaten Donald Trump, and there is absolutely a corollary between being good at the job and being good at explaining to the American people why you should be reelected. Listen, I'm somebody that's worked intimately with the president, right? I worked with him on the bipartisan gun bill. He was involved in every step of that process, not only constructing the bill, but winning individual Republican votes. It would not have passed if not for Joe Biden. And what has happened since we passed that bill? A 12 percent reduction in urban homicides in this country. There are literally thousands of people alive in this nation today because Joe Biden Biden is incredibly competent and he's incredibly effective. And but this partisan and this partisan hit job by somebody that is looking for a, a better Democrat we just played by a better. No, I'm talking about the special counsel yeah. who's looking for a better job in the next Trump administration is not going to dissuade Americans who actually see what the real world impact on their lives is of Joe Biden's administration. But you know, there is a difference here that we're talking about. Your fellow Democrat was talking about the ability to go out there and campaign. You just acknowledge a failure to communicate on a very important issue in regard to Palestinian lives. Is there a problem here? There's, there's not a problem. This president is going to be able to sell a record um, that is extraordinary. Um, unemployment at record lows, factory construction booming, crime down, inflation under control. And he is also somebody that has been the only one member of our party who has effectively beaten Donald Trump in a general election. Mm -hmm. So I know that he is ready for this campaign. I have seen how effective he has been up close and personal. And I'm not going to yeah. let my constituents be distracted by a special prosecutor who's trying to gain favor within the MAGA movement. Sarah Murphy. Good to have you Thank here. Thank you. We'll be right back. We're joined now by former CIA Deputy Director Michael Morrell. He's also CBS News senior national security contributor. And Samantha Vinograd, a former top counterterrorism official at the Department of Homeland Security. And she's here as a CBS contributor as well. And we want to note Sam served in the Obama White House and the National Security Council. And although she has left government, she's a senior advisor to the Biden Institute at the University of Delaware. Good to have both of you here. Good to be here. Mike, I want to start with you. Uh, the items that were in uh, President Biden's possession had markings TSSCI classification, top level uh, classification. The House Intelligence 
chair has said that Biden and Trump had basically the same level of documents inappropriately in their possession. Um, is that a fair comparison? It's, it's actually difficult to make a comparison for all sorts of reasons. I think what we can say um, is that President Trump had more documents than President Biden, although the difference is not huge. Um, we can say that both of them had confidential, secret, and top secret information. We can say that both of them had what's called restricted handling information, which requires special care because it's a higher sensitivity. Um, I think we can say that, that both of them had what's called um, formally restricted data information, which is information about U.S. nuclear weapons. That information for President Biden was dated, quite dated. Mm -hmm. Um, back to the 80s, I think. Back to the 1977, 1979. Mm -hmm. um, so both of them had sensitive information. Mm -hmm. And is it damaging? I mean, that sounds risky, but I mean, Sam, you have exposure to this, and people say, oh, there's overclassification these days. Sure, but let's keep in mind, this is not happening in a vacuum. Our partners and our adversaries are watching what was in that special counsel report, and our partners, who do share with us valuable intelligence that includes their sources and methods, can take assurance in the fact that this president, unlike his predecessor, self-reported having this information and advised his team to do exactly the same. Now, our adversaries got very unique insights into some endemic and significant vulnerabilities in the executive branch's processes for tracking and storing classified information. And that is why it is incredibly important, in my opinion, that the president announce a new effort to review how classified information is tracked and archived to avoid this happening again. Because it happened with Biden, Trump, and Mike Pence. But you just heard Mike, the president's lawyer, say these were just personal mementos in terms of that handwritten letter in regard to Afghanistan. But what does that say? What does that signal to men and women who aren't commander in chief but have to show up to work and would be held to account for having these kind of documents in their possession? You know, I'm not going to pass judgment on on Mr. Hur's decision to prosecute or not prosecute, right? I, I don't have that experience. Um, what, I, what I can say is that the senior officials in the government have a responsibility, greater responsibility than anybody else, to manage classified, classified information properly. Um, because if they don't, it sends a signal to everybody else that maybe you don't need to do that as well. So historically, senior officials who have mishandled classified information have been held accountable both by the Department of Justice and when the Department of Justice declines, as they did in this case, they've been held accountable by, by their agencies at very senior levels. Which, in this case, there isn't any There isn't leak somebody to do that, right? There, there's no one higher than the president. So sure. I think... He, he did say that he accepted responsibility, yeah. and I think that the proof in the pudding here is going to be... For not overseeing his staff. Yes, and I've, I've been involved in transitions, Margaret. I'm not here to defend the president or not defend the president. What I'm here to say is that, as a factual matter, the vice president was not packing boxes. Now, that said, mm -hmm. the president does have a responsibility to ensure that this does not happen again, and that is exactly why... I think that he should announce a review of the executive order that cu currently governs the classification, storage, and declassification of materials. I think that he should announce that he's appointing a senior official to oversee the processes involved. And as the report details, there were significant shortages in the resources available to the office of the vice president to ensure that classified material was treated appropriately. And it is on the president now to show this country that he is taking steps to rectify that situation. There's a there's a um, example that that is close to the president, um, John Deutsch, when he was the director of CIA, mm -hmm. um, during his entire time as director, was putting classified information on an unclassified laptop um, that was connected to the internet, putting that information at at risk. Um, when that was discovered, there was a a referral to the Department of Justice. They declined prosecution just as in this case. It came back to CIA for an administrative review. George Tenet held him accountable. He indefinitely took away his security clearance. In order to send a signal. In order to send a signal to the workforce that everybody's got to take the management of classified information seriously. And I think the president does need to send that signal. 
I think it is difficult to compare John Deutsch with a sitting president, but I agree with you that it is important to send a signal. As an employee at the White House, I had to sign a non-disclosure agreement, I had various ethical obligations and otherwise. And for the men and women at the National Security Council right now, they, they need to understand that their president values classified information as much as they do. And that's why I do think he needs to be on record announcing steps to avoid this happening again. And Should I'd he say have apologized? I think that he did acknowledge that he did ultimately hold the responsibility for there being a mishandling of information when he was vice president. You know, I'd say that he needs to go a little bit further. So I agree 100% that we need a new policy for how, how this is done at the end of administrations, 100%. I think he needs to go a little bit further in the apology. I think he needs to say, I should not have had this material. I put national security at risk. Um, I apologize to the American people for that. I apologize to the intelligence community, in particular to those CIA officers who put their lives at risk to collect some of it. There was CIA material in here. Um, and it's not going to happen again. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to make sure of that by making changes. Mm -hmm. A more full-throated apology. Um, I think it's important perspective on the merits of the issue itself, putting the politics aside. So I appreciate both of you sharing your experience with us. We'll be back in a moment. For more on the legal cases against former President Donald Trump, we're joined now by CBS News election law contributor David Becker, the founder of the Center for Election Innovation and Research. David, good to have you here. It has been a really busy week yes. on the presidential legal front, but it, it started with a really important decision from the D.C. Circuit that a former president does not have immunity from criminal prosecution. Donald Trump says he plans to appeal this to the Supreme Court of the United States. Do you expect them to take this case up? Well, I think it's an almost certainty that he will appeal. The deadline is tomorrow, is Monday. And then I think the Supreme Court is unlikely to take this up. It is a very strong opinion. These are three judges on the D.C. Circuit, often thought of as the second highest court in the land. They are, were appointed by two different presidents of two different parties. And it's a per curiam decision, meaning they're speaking with one voice unanimously. And they very clearly struck down this idea. And it's a somewhat extreme position that a president of the United States has blanket comprehensive immunity for any criminal acts they might have done. And it's a very, very strong opinion that I think um, a, a large majority of the Supreme Court is going to find compelling. Which will be significant um, yes. for, for them even to say that that's the law of the land here. But Donald Trump has repeatedly argued to his supporters, as you know, that everything he says is rigged. But on this, he says it will hamstring presidents without total immunity. The opposing party can extort and blackmail the president by saying, if you don't give us what we want, we'll indict you for things you did while in office. Is there any truth to that? Well, first of all, they address that in the opinion the D.C. Circuit does. And they apply this balancing test. And they really thought that the executive branch as a whole, not a particular president, but the executive branch and the public have a right to expect accountability from the president. But then even more so, it, it kind of ind indicates a, a lack of understanding about how the justice system works, particularly in the criminal context. In all of these cases that Trump is facing, whether they're federal, like in Florida or in D.C., or whether they're state-based, like in New York and in, uh, in Georgia, these were grand juries that were convened. Prosecutors had to present evidence before a grand jury of citizens, and they returned these indictments in each of these cases. And then even after that, the prosecutors face a very heavy burden, beyond a reasonable doubt, of proving to a jury of his peers that he committed these acts. Can you imagine how prosecutors have, have a weight on them when that happens? This is an independent investigation. There is no interference from, from the political class on these kinds of things. And they're going to end up having to prove their case before a jury. And you can imagine what would happen if a jury exonerates President Trump in any of these cases and how that might be a political windfall for him. You've just done a very good job of explaining the, the, how the system works. But for those who are only hearing the political slogans, what they see is that Joe Biden is not being prosecuted by the Justice Department for classified, mishandling classified information. Mike Pence wasn't either. But Donald Trump is specifically because he also went to efforts to not hand the, over those documents That's to right. law enforcement when they asked for them to be returned. For those who see this as unequal justice, like, how do you respond? 
Well, I think this week was a really good indication of how the Justice Department acts as independently as it does. We heard earlier that clearly the Biden administration is not happy with the release of the her report mm -hmm. on, on the investigation. And if they really had as much power over the Justice Department as former President Trump alleges, that wouldn't have been released. It clearly was. Mm -hmm. Also, I think ironically, we have to note that one of the four charges against former President Trump in D.C. is interference with the Justice Department. He was alleged to have interfered with the Justice Department, try to get them to investigate an election where everyone agreed there was no fraud and, the, and it was legitimate. And so I think it, again, represents kind of the politicization of this idea that anything that happens against the other side is good, anything that happens against our side is bad. But here we see both President Biden and former Vice President Pence were treated very similarly. And former President Trump was treated differently mainly because he withheld those documents mm -hmm. even when they, he was requested to, and he did not open his doors to the investigators to take a look at them. And you can read the indictments to see the details of specifically the lengths he went there. But uh, in the, you were in the courtroom at the Supreme yeah. Court this week as they were debating this case that came out of Colorado in regard to the 14th Amendment and keeping Trump off the ballot because of alleged role in insurrection. The impression seems to be the justices will rule against the state of Colorado. Is that what you walked away with? I think that's likely to be the case, and it could even be unanimous. I think what we saw, it was, it was such an illuminating argument. The nine justices were really having an, a discussion amongst themselves. Um, and what they all seemed to be troubled by was the idea that a single state could make a ruling on this, even after an evidentiary hearing as Colorado had, and that they could basically set the qualifications of a president, just one state for all 50, or that multiple states could come up with different ideas of qualifications. Mm -hmm. And for the presidency in particular, it's the, it's the most unusual election we have. It's the only one that has yeah. electors and electoral votes. So I think it's yeah. likely the court's going to rule that he can remain on the ballot. All right, David Becker, always great to have you. Thanks, Margaret. We'll be right back. Super Bowl 58 kicks off tonight right here on CBS. And earlier, we got a preview from host of the NFL Today and CBS News special correspondent, James Brown. You are covering your 12th Super Bowl, as I understand it. And you're right there in Vegas. The league was hesitant about putting a team in that city. Why? And, and how does it change things? Well, quite clearly and succinctly, it is the gambling capital of the world. And the league has worked diligently, assiduously to maintain the integrity of the game with no influence that way. The Supreme Court has made gambling legal. It has always been a part of the game, but the league has been decidedly focused on keeping it separate. I know you have followed for years the concerns, the very real health concerns related to concussions and injuries. Um, the NFL commissioner, Roger Goodell, said in his press conference, the league has made a lot of progress on lowering injuries, but admitted they still have a lot more work to do. How are they managing that? The old school football game was a tough, brutal game. Defenses did not play. Significant changes since. $1.2 billion by the league and the settlement with the players going towards retired players and their medical needs. $320 million this year. Significant progress in terms of concussion research. Rules on the field. Officials are serious about watching how well the game is played properly. You may get one warning, a second one, and you're out. And I think most significantly, the medical community has the last say. If a player is injured on the field and they determine that player to have suffered a concussion, the coaching staff has no say in the matter. The medical staff runs the show, and there is concussion protocol that that player has to go through for a week, 10 days, two weeks, whatever it is, until they meet a baseline to allow them to go back into action. So it, that sounds like there's improvement. Um, one thing you and I have spoken about in the past, and I know you feel passionately about this, was the challenge in regard to diversity in the NFL. The last time I spoke with you, you said the track record was pitiful. Do you think it's improved? Considerably improved. Not enough. And to the credit of the commissioner, Roger Goodell, Troy Vincent, his executive vice president of football operations, 
they continue to push. There is about a 51% increase in terms of diversity across the league. In the leadership positions, the C-suite positions, we've got more folks of color and women who are running the show there because excellence and success is not unique to one given group of people, and I'm glad to see that that's starting to take place. JB, has that diversity impacted how some of the players feel? I know you'd said in the past it was kind of getting to them. You know what? The players are seeing significant progress. As a matter of fact, right here in Las Vegas, the Raiders have the second female president running the organization. Miss Sandra Douglas Morgan, an African-American, a woman of color, actually biracial. Uh, she's running this organization. Amy Trask was the president for the Raiders a number of years ago. So the Raiders have really set the bar high for a number of other teams. I look at the Denver Broncos. There is a significant number of women who are in the ownership ranks of that organization as well. And then when you look at the assistant coaching ranks, since 2013, there's been a 30% increase in the number of assistant coaches who are people of color. So the players are seeing that progress and they're very thankful because many of them will like to go that route in the future as well. Great points, JB, thank you. And you can see JB on the NFL today starting at 2 p.m. CBS's all day coverage of the Super Bowl begins right here on CBS next after a quick break. That's it for us today. Thank you for watching until next week. For Face the Nation, I'm Margaret Brennan.